Hello, and welcome to another tip and trick with David Earl and Logic 10. So I've got here this session, and it's pretty big. I've got uh, 183 tracks. Of course, they're not all playing all at the same time. They're sequenced out, but I do have a lot of tracks playing. And what I want to be concerned about when you have that many tracks is CPU load. So if I hit play, I'm just going to see if it plays. Oh. Yep, sounds like it plays just fine. Now, if you want to see your CPU load, what you do is in Logic 10, you want to make sure that you're using the custom setting under your LCD display. And over to the right, where it says CPU, just click there. There you go. You double click and it opens up CPU HD. So your CPU threads are going to be on the left-hand side, and your disk I.O. is going to be on the right-hand side. Over on the left-hand side, when we look at these threads, they're not CPUs. I don't have 16 CPUs or 24 CPUs. I actually have eight cores, eight processors, and they are being, there is information, little information highways being threaded to them. And that's what this is showing me right here on the audio side. On the right hand side, I have the disk IO. This is showing me how efficiently audio is being streamed off of the disk drive. Now when you hit play, you'll see an initial spike, a lot of activity in the uh, CPUs, and then they'll sort of even out as Logic tries to figure out how to delegate the responsibilities of the processors, and you'll see that in the disk I.O. as well. The initial pull off the disk I.O. is going to be strong, and then it'll kind of, kind of even out a little bit, it'll come down. So as you see, I still have a lot of bandwidth. I have a lot of headroom uh, on those threads. Uh, I could put more plugins on. I could do a lot more work. The disk I.O. also looks really good. And that's because I follow a lot of uh, CPU saving practices when I'm working in Logic 10. So let's take a look at the mixer because that's usually where your CPU uh, hit is going to come. Uh, if I open up the mixer and I look at my channel strips, you notice that most of my channel strips, yeah, there's a lot of plugins going on, but on most of the channel strips, there's maybe one or two plugins. Uh, I have up to four on that one. If I come down the line a little bit, this ES2 has a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's got six plugins on it. Now, what's the importance of that? Well, the more plugins you have, the more it's going to hit one thread. Logic is going to allocate the threads by channel strip. So if you have an ES2 here, and let's say I just wanted to keep adding more plugins, and I end up getting more and more of a spike on one of my threads, what I can do is I can sort of uh, get another channel strip activated uh, to help loosen the load up and, and spread it out amongst the CPUs. And here's how you can do that. I'll select the channel strip and close the mixer. And on the left-hand side, I see my channel strip. And on the right-hand side, I see the output. That's kind of what you normally see when you have a channel strip that has a stereo out. If you click here, you see the output. If you click here, this is showing the bus. I've got a doubler going on over here, so that's all cool. Now, what I want to do is I want to be able to take, let's say, three of these plugins off of this channel strip and put them onto an auxiliary. Here's the trick. Click on Stereo Out, and where it says Output, we're going to change it to a bus that's not being used right now. So bus 58, yeah, I know, that's a hell of a lot of buses. It's kind of ridiculous. I think I've got a problem. All right, bus 58. So now the ES2 goes through all these plugins, goes off to this bus, and then it goes to bus 58. Bus 58 doesn't have anything on it right now, but the ES2 flows down through these plugins, and then it comes down through here, and then goes to our stereo out. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the last three plugins, I'm going to hold command and drag them over. So I haven't really interrupted the flow yet. The ES2 comes down through the bit crusher, the exciter, the spreader. It gets bust off, and then it goes to the output. Now, for the output, I'm probably going to put this back up to 0 dB, 
and I'm going to take this fader and I'm going to pull it down to negative 9 or negative 9, 8 as it, as it were. That's because I still want the full signal to travel to this auxiliary. Now bus 4, I want it to be bussed after all of the plugins like it was before. So I'm going to take note of my settings at 0 dB. I'll say no send. Click on bus 58 so that it's that auxiliary is in focus. Click and hold. Go to bus. Choose bus 4. Turn up that send. And now what I've effectively done is I've taken the load and spread it out to two channel strips, which is also going to take that load and spread it out to two threads on my CPU. Now, do you need to do this? Not really. Most computers are really, really efficient these days and will handle a pretty serious load. But if you ever start encountering big CPU spikes um, where one thread is being just hit really hard, um, this is one way that you can start allocating uh, some of the CPU load so that the you know you're still going to get the same sound um, and you can stack even more plugins. I mean you can start getting ridiculous like you could apply you could apply eight on one and eight on another. You could actually um, go past logic's limit of inserts, which I think has just been changed. It's something like 16. Honestly, if you need that many inserts, that many plugins, you've got a problem. <laughs> All right. So that was one thing I wanted to talk about. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, just plugins that you're using on channel strips. And to do that, I want to actually start from a new template. I'm going to go new, hit close, don't save. And it should pop up a new logic session here any day now. There we go. Are you sure about using it exactly? Yes, I'm sure. Because that was, was taking something in from a Pro Tools session. All right, so I'm going to choose a software instrument. Now, you note that when I pop a software instrument on, I get a blank channel strip on the left-hand side. Um, that's handy. I like being able to open a new software instrument and have a blank instrument. Normally, when you first start using Logic, you'll get an electric piano. And it's kind of a pain because you always get an electric piano when you open it up. Well, it's easy enough to change. All you do is you come over to your channel strip settings, click Legacy, Logic, and choose something like Logic Instruments and EXS24. Okay, so when we choose that in the library for a channel strip setting, it's going to try loading in an EXS24, and i got to skip all these samples because it's not... No, I don't want the additional content. Okay, there we go. This was actually a legacy channel strip that just had an EXS24 on it. Now, personally, I don't care about the EXS24. I'm actually going to take it off. And then, once I do that, I click Save, and I would save it to my instruments. So that channel strip setting, this blank channel strip setting, is now saved to my user patches. And I called that channel strip setting Default. And then down under this little gear, it says define as default. So every time I open up a new software instrument, that's what I get. Now, we are talking about CPU saving stuff. Um, when you start loading in all these cool sounds, like let's say I go to a piano and choose uh, this Steinway, for example. When I pop the Steinway on, you see it automatically created all of these plugins and it created two buses. And those two buses, one has a space designer. Actually, it's got two space designers. So it's automatically popped in two pretty CPU-heavy reverbs that I might not even want, right? So there's a way that we can disable that so that as we keep loading more and more uh, patches in, we can get rid of those channel strip settings. Now, in Logic 9, it was really bad because we had EQs and um, reverbs and compressors and all that stuff were placed directly on the channel strip. And when it comes to compressors and EQs, they're not so bad. They're pretty efficient. But when you started getting into space designers on every channel strip, your CPU just gets hand, it gets hammered. So um, what you can do to when you incorporate these library sounds, you can come down here to where it says enable patch merging and turn off the sends. So these are the things that are going to come through 
when you load in these presets. So if I take off the sends, it's not going to automatically create a reverb and bust to two reverbs. Now I could also take off the audio effects, but honestly, you probably won't need to because Logic 10 is a lot more intelligent and um, doesn't put uh, big reverbs or really heavy um, effects directly on the channel strip. So you should be okay. And uh, MIDI effects don't take up much CPU at all. So having these three on, I totally suggest that. And then once you have that, you could actually save it as a template. And there you go. So when you're popping plugins on your channel strip, just, you know, using compression, using EQ, using simple modulation like chorus and flanging and that sort of thing, um, that'll be fine directly on the channel strip. But when you start thinking about delay-based effects or big spatial effects like reverbs and delays and things like that, um, it may be a good idea to start thinking about using sends and buses. You know, like if I come down here to, to my bus 3 and I pop a delay on there, there's a lot of advantages to doing that. The first, well, our CPU isn't going to get hit quite as hard if I've got a bunch of tracks that have the ability to use bus 3 to go to this delay. And I have the ability to go that delay from any other track. So it's really, you know, it's a win-win situation uh, using busing. Now, popping a tape delay directly on the track, well, you know, tape delay is not as heavy as some other things that you could use, like a reverb or something like that. But what's kind of funny, I bet if I open this up, yeah, 500 millisecond tape delay. So yeah, it's not really going to be that extreme. One little trick. I was going to show you a little trick. I, I might as well show you now. So there's actually a delay built into this patch. But what I use a tape delay for a lot, and this is totally outside CPU stuff, but I'm just going to give you a freebie. Turn off sync. Turn this all the way down. And now, basically, there's no delay. But what you're getting, oop, the delay that we're hearing is the stereo delay that I set up. Okay, so I don't hear any tape delay, but what I am getting is I'm getting a tape emulation. So that sort of warmth that you hear, um, if you use the tape delay and you turn the delay all the way down to zero, it's sort of like just running the sound through a tape and then sending it back out. So there's your little tape emulation. You might want to not have the high cut and low cut so heavy. But Okay, there you go. That's a freebie for you. But in terms of CPU saving, just remember that if you have a lot of effects and big instruments on single channel strips, that's going to take a lot of CPU. Um, if you want to spread out your plugins that are on an individual on the individual channel strips, use buses by sending out directly from the output. Um, one other thing to look out for, actually, before we go, um, if you have a multi-out instrument, like, say, Contact or something like that, let's say you have a Contact sampler and you choose multi-output, those are also going to take up a little bit more um, CPU. And a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I have Contact and I want to load in a whole bunch of instruments and have my multi uh, set up in contact. So I have one contact and then, you know, I load it up and it's just ready to go. So they open up, uh, you know, they'll have a drum kit and they'll have a funk guitarist or damage or something like that, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff in contact loaded up and ready to go, which seems like a good idea. But if we think about what we were talking about with the CPU usage, not so great because this one contact is now taking up a ton of CPU. We can actually see the thread already poking up there. So it's better to use multiple contacts across many, many channel strips um, rather than have one contact filled to the brim with cool sounds. So there you go. A extensive look at CPU saving maneuvers. Um, if you use those maneuvers, you can get away with really low IO buffer sizes. Um, the IO buffer size of 64 here, um, that's really low. And that other huge song that I showed you with 130 tracks or whatever it was, um, 
it's using a buffer size of 64. Now, usually when I mix, I mix with a higher buffer size because this is basically how long Logic gets to think about the audio before it spits it at you. And um, the lower that is, the more kind of glitchy artifacts you can get because Logic's got to just really hit the CPU hard to be able to think about it. Normally, people mix all the way up to 256 or 512, but I get away with 64 because I use CPU saving techniques. All right. Well, I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Very much like to thank Pyramide for hosting me here once again. Um, I think this institution is really cool. And until I came here for the first time, I had never seen anything like it in my whole life. What I think really separates us from other people who teach is that we are outrageously passionate about what we do, and especially in electronic music. Since since coming to Pyramind, I, I've discovered electronic music, and you know, San Francisco being a mecca for underground electronic music opened up so many doors for me and kind of blew my mind. We cover everything from absinthe to contact. When people get to the mind-melting level, uh, we get into modular synthesis. Everything about native instruments, everything about logic synths, down to the, the finest detail. We, we learned it all. The fundamentals of understanding how things work, that's just essential. But then beyond that, there's so much more, and that's where it gets into just a lot of, of the artistic side of like the creative approach of, of why you do something, not just how. There's a lot of schools that just, you know, they focus on the technicality of, of recording music, um, but I wanted something that would foster creativity and, and really helped me develop as an artist as well. Each of our genre-specific programs comes in four levels. There's a basic, an advanced, a professional, and then a master's level. And the master's level is, of course, everything we do. It's the largest and most powerful programs that we can create for you.